So on New Year's Eve, going into New Year's Day, I was given two very quick uh, dreams. And one dream was um, that me and a handful of people from our church, and I'm believing it's probably the Bible study group, but I, I couldn't see their faces. I just know I had a handful of people, and we were in a barn. But the barn was referred to as the storehouse. Now, the church is referred to as the storehouse. We were in the storehouse, and we were all just walking around the storehouse praying. And as we were praying, this beautiful, translucent fire of God just lit up the inside, the interior of the walls. So the walls were on fire, but not a bad fire. It was a beautiful, translucent, gorgeous, holy fire that was just illuminating the walls, and it was beautiful. Then it jumps to, I'm in an old-fashioned house. Um, it's, uh, a, it, it was immaculate. It was beautiful. It wasn't like super fancy or rich, but it was just this beautiful, kind of like a cottage-type home, but it was like decorated old-fashionedly, like, uh, I don't even know if that was a word, but uh, like, like the late 1800s, early 1900s. And again, the handful of us were walking around all in prayer while the walls were on holy fire. So uh, old-fashioned, um, I, I was trying to think old-fashioned morality. We, it shouldn't be considered old-fashioned, but with today's morality, godly morality is considered old-fashioned. So um, yeah, Azusa Street, someone yeah, thought of Azusa Street. Now, where, oh man, Anne-Marie. All right, well, Maybe at the end of the service, I'll have Anne-Marie share, because um, then what happened was I told the Bible study to start with, because we'll probably, I'll, I'll probably implement other things, but to start with, we'll come to Bible study like a half hour early, and we will pray through the building, you know, and just pray, pray together, pray separately, pray in tongues, praying. We prayed over every chair. I was anointing the walls with oil. It was great until like the devil tried to sabotage it at the end, but we kind of saw that as a attack of the devil because he doesn't like the fact that we want to pray. And I was thinking maybe on a Saturday morning, whether I come here by myself or anybody want to join me, you know, I might, I may start that also so that, you know, we, this should be a house of prayer. So I just want to share that with you so that you can mull it over in your heart. And, uh, you know, if you, if you ever want, if you want to share anything based off of what I just told you, you know, please do. All right, so I'm going to be jumping into Colossians 3.18. You know, I, I figure we, sometimes we can't always finish a chapter. So it's going to be from 3.18 to chapter 4.4. 4. I wanted to go to 4.18, but it was just so much, and I didn't want to keep you here for six hours. So I figured, you know, I'd cut it down. <laughs> so, um, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your children. I thank you for your son Jesus who died on the cross to provide a way for us to be free. He took our place on the cross and then he rose from the dead to give us victory. And if we give our hearts to you, we are yours because all you want to do is have an, a relationship with your kids. That's all you want. So I'm thankful that all those that have given their heart truly to you, Jesus, is a kid of the King. And so, Father God, we ask that you bless this service, bless the word. None of me and all of you speak through me, Holy Spirit. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so Colossians. Colossians, I'm jumping right in. And this is going to be fun. You're not going to like it, but you're going to like it because by the time I'm done with it. Oh, Anne Marie's here. Anne Marie, you ready to share a little bit before I start? Okay, so then I'll just rewind, do editing and all that fun stuff. But um, Anne Marie. On, on Tuesday night, uh, she got a vision, so, and so, you know, while she was praying. Okay, um, prayer before, you know, on Tuesday nights, we, Tuesdays we do, you know, Bible study, so just came half an hour early for, to devote to prayer, um, inspired by her dreams that you spoke about, okay, and uh, it was just a few of us, and I was walking up and down the aisle, and um, just thanking God for this this place, this church, and just just entering His gates with thanksgiving. And uh, I've been here since like 1984, and 
pastor, you know, the church bought the building in 83. And I know that, you know, Pastor Rob and the congregation you know, dedicated this, this church to God, um, consecrated it to God, the property, the land, the building, from the get-go and said it was, it was always going to be for, you know, the promotion of the kingdom of God. And uh, I don't know, I was just very surprised because as I was in prayer, I, I started to, it wasn't just a vision, it wasn't just a word of knowledge, it was like a, an ex, it was like an experience, you know. Um, I, I started to, to feel like all the, all the prayers of everyone who's passed through this church, all the congregations, um, I've, all the prayers were, it was saturated in, in the floor, in the ground. And I mean, and it, like, I felt it like in a really tangible way, like the whole place was like saturated in all the prayers over all the years of all the pe people who have passed through. Some have gone to glory, some are whatever. But, and, and on the altar, I just felt, Pastor Rob, I just kind of saw him pacing up and down and up and down and his prayer just saturated um, the, the, the altar. And um, why was I like, wow. Yeah, I'm like, well, I could feel everyone's prayer. I'm like, I know my mom, you know, I thought about my mom and I was able to feel her prayer. Actually, her, you know, it was coming from like over there somewhere, you know, and um, just saying we are, you know, and then, then, then the Bible verse, you know, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And, um, you know, when we, when we, that's what God's desire is. We're, we're a living tabernacle. We're, we're a dwelling place for God. And prayer is our communication with God and our communion with God. And it's not just, rep you know, telling God everything you need or you want or whatever. It's communion and it's listening to God. And it's, it's, it's an intimate relationship with God. And that's what his desire is. Um, you know, he dwelt, he tabernacled among men, and we are living stones. We are living, being built up into that dwelling place of God, and and is this plan from the beginning? Even in the tabernacle of Moses, you know, the whole goal was to get to that place, that that presence of God after the the altar and the sacrifice, and and um, also that fire, the altar, the fire has to keep burning and. Um, in our lives and purifying and to sanctification that we always have to go through. We have to be sanctified and then the more sanctified we are, the more we'll be in the presence of God and the more in the presence of God we are, the more we'll be like him and we'll radiate him to everyone. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Serious. <laughs> <laughs> so, just, just, I'm so thankful and grateful that God, you know, is able to uh, give this to me to share and there's really, it's really something to it. Like this, you know, all those prayers from all these decades uh, of people coming in and out, you know, they benefited us and, and we're here. Now we'll saturate, let's saturate the, continue the work and uh, let's uh, get that holy fire. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, right? Okay, cool. That was awesome. All right, so my title today is As Unto the Lord, and we're diving into Colossians 3.18 in the New Living Translation, and then I'll read it in the Passion. Wives, <laughs> submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. And then in the Passion Translation, let every wife be supportive and tenderly devoted to her husband. For this is a beautiful illustration of our devotion to Christ. See, a lot of times women don't want to hear those words, you know, because, you know, you've had yucky men out there that like to abuse and change the meaning of the word submit to be like, you know, you listen to me, woman. I'm the dictator, you know. You submit to me. And it's like, okay. And, um, you know, that's not exactly what it means. <laughs> um, and then everyone kind of seems to forget that in Ephesians 5.21, in the New Living Translation, it says, and further, submit to one another 
out of reverence for Christ. And then the Passion says, and out of your reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other in love. So for a wife to submit, she's being supportive and she's tenderly devoted to her husband in love. But we are also to submit to one another. But what does it mean to submit? Well, years back, I, I learned this wonderful meaning of what it means, and it set me free. It's to be under one's mission. You see? We all are on a mission. But when you love others, you are under their mission. You've got their back. You're their biggest cheerleader. You are there to, you know, like Pastor Rob was very supportive. And, you know, his job was to recognize gifts. And so, you know, I remember we got married and then... Um, he wanted me to be full-time with him, so I stopped working at the accounting office, and then I would go into the prayer closet, and I'd be in there for kind of a couple of hours. I would just have a good time in the Lord. And I'd come out, and then we'd talk. And then he'd go, gosh, I knew I married a Christian, but I didn't know I married a prayer warrior, and you have so much word in you, Jess, you know? He goes, you can't be like the Dead Sea. You've got to pour it out. It flows in you. You've got to let it out, and you've got to share the word with the people. And I, that was a man right there that was under my mission. He was supporting me. He had my back. He was kind of like coaching me and encouraging me towards what he saw as God's destiny for me, whatever the gifts things were. And I didn't even know, like, I was like, okay. And then I remember the first time I spoke, I didn't even think it was a big deal. But then all of a sudden people were like, wow, you have a teaching anointing. I'm like, okay, like, all right. And then I was trying to figure things out, okay? I guess when you have a certain anointing, it comes so naturally, supernatural to you that you don't feel like it's a big deal, but others, it's ministering to them, so I guess it's a big deal to them. I don't know. You know, it was so weird, but that was a man right there that was submitting, and you say, well, oh my gosh, your husband was submitting to you? It says right here, submit one to another. And there he was. He was under my mission. He had my back. He was pushing me into what God had for me. That was beautiful. So, mutual submission in Christ, God's people submitting to one another in their interpersonal relationships, has as its goal to do what's best for others and to help them fulfill their God-given purposes. So, we are, even as the body of Christ, are to do what's best for each other and to help each other fulfill our God-given gifts and purpose. This principle is to apply, be applied, first of all, to the Christian family. Submission, being under one's mission. Humility, very important. Gentleness is very, very important. Patience and respect. Respect, especially for men. But all humans need respect. But I know that I've learned through the years, because Pastor Rob was always trying to teach me about the mind of a man, that men view respect as love. So if they feel that you're not respecting them, they feel that you're not loving them. These must be characteristics reflected in the life of each member of the family. So yes, wives are to submit to their husbands. They're supposed to be supportive and tenderly devoted. But also, husbands are to be tenderly and um, devoted and supportive of, of their wives because it does say submit to one another. So God sees the wife's actions toward her husband as an actual part of her obedience to Jesus. The wife is called to respect, regard, and deeply care for her husband. Her attitude should be as unto the Lord. Everything you do is unto the Lord, which is of the highest esteem and regard. Now, in my past life, and I'm, I didn't live like before this life, but I had a life before this life. I was married to somebody who was not very nice, okay? <laughs> very mm, narcissistic and abusive, uh, verbally, mentally, and occasionally physically. And I lived my life, like the man did not deserve my respect. He did not, I mean, he actually deserved for me to lash out at him and give it right back. But I did not, because I was saying, Lord, <sighs> unto you when he lashes out or, I mean, he used to do it for sport. He used to love to just like insult me and, and, and do it in front of people for sport and it would just give him thrills on Mulberry Hill, I don't know. But 
I would just say, Lord, help me to react in a way that would give you glory. You know? And I was doing and living unto the Lord. And I was clinging to Jesus. Because I knew that if I allowed this man to do, you know, what he wanted to do, that I might not be mentally well today. But because I clung to Jesus and I did everything unto him, I did not let this person affect me in the way that the, the devil would have liked him to. Because remember, we don't, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, you know, in the unseen realm. So, and that's going to also, I'm, I'm going to um, also go into the next few verses um, later on when we're talking about honoring your parents and stuff. So we'll get to more of that. I'll elaborate more on that. So, so now we know women are to be supportive and tenderly devoted to their husband within reason if they're mar not married to a monster. But even so, when you're married to a monster, I know what that feels like. Oh, Lord, I hope he'll never watch this. So anyway, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> yeah, he might. Well, you know, calling a spade a spade. You know, you just then you start working on saying, okay, Lord, this is between you and me. That person's toxic. I'm going to react in a way that will give you glory. Help me to react and respond in a way that will give you glory. I did not give him what he deserved. Sylvia can attest to that. Did I ever insult the man or embarrass him or disrespect him in front of people? Okay. And I didn't do it privately. You know, sometimes I would try to gently sit him down and talk to him and express my feelings and, you know, like... And, and, and it, was, it was like talking to a doe caught in the headlights. You know, it was like, and then he snapped out of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> the demons kept you from listening. All righty. But, you know, but that was life. And that was a life that's no longer for me. You know, because then I married this man who, <sighs> yeah, he was the opposite. So, Colossians 3.19 in the New Living Translation. This is another one. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Huh. And then in the Passion, it says, let every husband be filled with cherishing love for his wife and never be insensitive toward her. Okay, let's go into more scripture. And then we'll elaborate a little. Um, Ephesians 5.25 in the New Living Translation for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. Ephesians 5, 28 through 29. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they loved their own bodies. Oh, I forgot my magazine. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, for a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. Okay, so love your wives and don't tr treat them harshly. I think that might be connected to testosterone. So there was a, a movie that me and Victoria were watching, and... and um, the woman, no, no, it was, a, it was a reality show or something. I don't know. I don't remember. But the woman said, speak beautiful things to a beautiful woman, right? To, to speak beautiful or treat her like a flower because you can, she's fragile and you can damage her petals. And then, yeah. So don't never treat them harshly. Don't be insensitive. And, uh, I mean, this is, I mean, I'll get into it later, but, you know, loving your wife as Christ loves the church and he gave up his life for her, that's pretty heavy duty. You've guys got, uh, like, a harder um, uh, task <laughs> than we do. But, but to love a wife like you love your own body, well, if you think about it, why would you do that? Well, Eve was taken out of his side. She was part of his body. So he's loving her like his own body. He's caring for her like his own body. Because in marriage, we are supposed to become one. That's not always the case. I know from experience, you can be married and not be one. And you can be married and you can truly be one. Um, 
So everything I'm telling you is probably within more of a healthy scenario. It's much harder when you're dealing with toxic people. So take that into consideration. This is not a cookie cutter message like everything, every situation is completely and totally personalized. So the husband's headship must be exercised in love, gentleness, and consideration for his wife and family. The husband is to take the lead, which he's supposed to be the leader of the household. I didn't get that scripture, but he is. Um, he must take the lead in submitting to be under the mission to and serving the best interests of his wife and children. He must help his wife fulfill her God-given roles at home. But that goes both ways. The wife should be helping to for help fulfill her husband's roles, you know, in his... Uh, in his God-given gifts, in the ministry, because we're all in the ministry, whether we realize it or not, in his workplace, in his business. So we are, you know, everything goes back and forth, hand in hand. The wife, um, he must help her fulfill her God-given roles, and, he, and, and we must help uh, our husbands fulfill theirs. He is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. This is a calling that is much more of an extreme expression of submission and devotion than is the wife. Because the Lord is not saying, I mean, you know, if you truly do love somebody, you will give your life for that person. So that goes without saying, but he's demanding that the husband do that. That's, woo, that's heavy. He's called to lay down his life for his wife. Okay, so some people like get, like, um, get upset when you talk about the husband being the leader. Pastor Rob had a really great, like um, example, he was like, it's very important. Yes, because he used to always confer with me before he made decisions, but he always had the last um, word on it. Like he would, we would, he would say, Jess, what do you think? You know, and then he would have the last decision. You know, and that was fine. But he always, he didn't just do it without talking to me. He was very, very, um, very, very considerate that way. It was very nice. But he says, but when it comes down to it, the husband is the leader. He says, so let's say you're in a, a theater and you're seeing a movie with your wife and your kids. All of a sudden, a fire breaks out in the theater. If we have the husband saying, let's go to this exit, and the wife's like, no, let's go to this exit, and they all they want to split up, then that could be you know, very unstable. Uh, somebody could get hurt. But leadership especially in panic situations it should be shown that the husband is the leader let's go this way okay and everybody follows him out that way to safety so think of it that way um you know it's really weird and i did not expect this but last night i was watching the end of the titanic right because i don't know that's just the type of movie you don't even care where you come in that movie you just watch it and and then it came to me this morning that okay they weren't married, but, um, oh man, I forgot their names. Jack, Jack, come back, Jack. All right, Jack. <laughs> okay, so Rose and Jack, okay. So what I loved is that Jack, I don't know if you noticed this, but Jack, he was on his game. He always knew what to do. He had such a cool head on his shoulders. Every time there was some sort of situation, he was always just taking Rose and going, come on, Rose, come on, Rose, let's do this, Rose. Do this. And it was like, and Rose, what did Rose do? She followed his lead. Now, no, they were not married, but I'm just taking that as an example. Like, that man, because see, we're emotion. females are more emotional, men are more logical, even though I, I think I'm a pretty logical female. But, but when it comes down to it, we panic, they don't. They get calm, they start thinking clearly, and then they take us in the way that we should go. And maybe that's one of the reasons why, among many reasons. So that's what I realized. Like, Jack was the man. Like, he just led the way, and he was like, all right, Rose, we got to do this. All right, Rose, we got to stay on the boat as long as possible. Oh, okay, right, Rose. And he's just leading her, and he's taking his woman, and then they're, like, on the back of the boat, and they're, like, waiting, and he's like, all right, Rose, you know, don't let go of my hand. Take a breath and, 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 and kick because the boat's going to suck us down. I mean, he was just, I don't know, he just had supernatural wisdom, okay? I know it was a movie, but Jack was the man. And then when they were out in the water, 
I mean, that man sacrificed his life for her. He put her on the wood because he knew that would give her a better chance of surviving, not being submersed in the water. He, I believe, just by watching it for the 15th time, that he knew he was going to die. Because, obviously, I mean, the kid knew everything. So he knew about hypothermia. So, <laughs> so he's there, and he's shivering his, you know, took us off. And he's looking at her, and he goes, Rose. And that's when I realized he knew he was going to die. He said, Rose, no matter what happens, even if the situation seems hopeless, don't give up. Don't give up. Like, basically, stay alive. Because you're going to have babies, and you're going to do this. And, you, and he said, promise me this, Rose. And she said, I promise. And she fell asleep, and then, I don't know, they fell asleep, and then she's, like, singing, looking at the stars. And then she hears the guys coming with the boat to look for survivors. And all of a sudden, she's like, Jack, Jack. And then when she realizes Jack was dead... She was so sad, and then she just put her head down like, I give up. Oh, let me just die. But then all of a sudden, her eyes came open, like, and she, re she, she remembered her promise, and she was like, come back, come back, right? So she's like letting go of Jack and crying, and then she got that whistle, and she's like, with determination. And what did she do? She lived to, actually, he prophesied over her. He told her, you are going to die warm in your bed as an old lady. And that's what she did. So, but that was all by the lead of a strong male. And, and what I mean, strong masculine male, is that they know how to be in their masculine, which is not abusive. Okay? It's covering. It's protecting. It causes you to feel safe. Because I'm, I'm, one thing you guys know about Pastor Abu is very masculine in the sense that he made me feel very, very safe. And that's, that's the way it should be. We should not be in survival mode. We should be able to rest into our men. So, okay, that was really a rabbit trail. But, you know, it was a good one, okay? Okay. So, you know, and there was something else. La, 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 la. Okay, so each marriage partner does his or her part in being under each other's mission or calling to be a support to each other, and it brings the marriage to its absolutely full of potential. If you've got a great marriage like that where you're each other's support, you are like, you're in the zone. A marriage lived out in this mutually loving, mutually loving, mutually loving environment mirrors the interactive love that Christ has for his church and his church is called to have toward him. Now, I wanted to read, so it was so cool, because yesterday, you know, I was at the Browers, um, it was um, Pastor Roseanne's birthday, the ladies aging backwards, I don't know if you noticed, and so they asked me, they're always asking me, because they're always very interested in everything about me, they love me so much, so they was like, what are you speaking on yesterday? So I said, oh, it's going to be fun, it's on submitting, you know, and all that, so, so she was like, Kenneth Hagin just, you know, like wrote a, you know, a article, and <clears throat> I've been getting Kenneth Hagin magazine since I was 12, I've been a a partner with him since I was about 12, 13 years old. And, and let me tell you, I, I love his little magazines. I would eat his magazines. I, would, I was his partner, and I'm talking like I was in the projects. I did not get paid for doing chores. There was no allowance. If, a dollar, if I came across a dollar, that was like gold, and I would put my little dollar in an envelope and send it to Kenneth Hagin because that's all I had. He, he's my spiritual grandpa. So I got to read this because it's so good, all right? Okay, you ready? Okay. Because it's all about this. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. It was like everything's so poetically perfect. Okay. In talking about marriage, people often bring up Ephesians 5.22 where Paul tells wives to submit themselves to their own husbands. But if we look at verse 21, we see that Paul is giving instructions to the entire church at Ephesus saying, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Then in the next verse, he brings up the marriage relationship. By taking scripture out of its setting, you can make it say anything you want. People have often quoted verse 22 about wives submitting to their husbands out of context. They leave the impression that the man is the dictator of the home and the woman is supposed to do whatever he says. Well, if that's the case, we in the church are supposed to be dictators over one another as well. Because verse 21 tells the entire church at Ephesus to submit yourselves one to another. What did Paul really mean? 
He was telling the Ephesians to get along with each other. He never meant for any one person in the church to be a dictator over others. He wanted the Ephesians to understand that it was easy to submit in the rule, to the rule of love. Paul was saying the same thing when he said, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Some get the doctrinal error by overemphasizing that the husband is the head of the wife. They say that the wife doesn't have any say-so whatsoever, and they believe that the husband has the right to treat her like a doormat. But the Bible teaches that the husband should love his wife in the same way that Christ loves the church. He should nourish and cherish his wife as Christ cherishes the church. The husband should cherish his wife's health and happiness by putting her first. He should love her for better, um, love her better than he loves himself. God is love, and man is God's creation. Therefore, um, man is a creation of love. When God created woman to be man's companion and help meet, he took a part of man and formed the woman. The woman became flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. Notice in Ephesians 5.28, Paul made reference to what God did in Genesis, how God made woman out of man. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. The Lord also said, that the man should be, uh, uh, that it is not good for a man to be alone. Pastor Robbie used to always say that. I will make him a help meet for him. The Hebrew word for help meet means an answering unto. I think it's the most unique expression in this wonderful description. Um, a woman was made as an answer to the heart need, the spiritual need, the mental need, and the physical need of a man. I thought that was beautiful. God intended that the wife, okay, wife be the queen or the head of the home. And he's the king, obviously. Now the man is the head of the wife, but she's the head of the home. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it. So I thought that was great. But and I, I'm not coming after you husbands. I'm not. I'm just saying because of the world we live in, that submit to your wife thing was always like put to the extreme. Because truthfully, it should be mutual. We should be loving and respecting and submitting or being supportive of one another. Respect is very important. Speaking, you know, um, the truth in love. So, okay. So that was cool. Is everybody okay with that? Was good? I thought it was good. I, don't know. I, I had fun with the Holy Spirit. I always do. I think my favorite time with him is every Sunday morning beforehand going over the message. He always gives me some stuffs. So... Colossians 3.20, the New Living Translation. We're moving on to the children's here. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. And then in the Passion Translation, let the children respect and pay attention to their parents in everything, for this pleases our Lord Jesus. Okay. And then Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may be, live long on the earth. Okay, so as you're growing up, it is very important to obey your parents, as long as they're not crazy, you know, okay? As long as they're normal, healthy people. Within re Everything's always within reason, because you're not going to have a, oh, uh, uh, oh, my mom told me to steal that thing at the store, no, that's, she's asking you to sin. But within reason, as long as they're not asking you to sin or do anything bad, obey your parents because it pleases the Lord and then it's kind of training you to obey him. But the respect, honor your father and mother, to respect them, that can be hard. Especially if you have a toxic parent. Um, <clears throat> so my advice would be the same advice that I followed for myself when I was in a toxic situation. You honor and respect them. You can leave the situation. You know, just find a way to speak to them. It could be sternly but respectfully. I could tell you with an absolutely clear conscience, I've never disrespected my mother. Even if I felt she was wrong or out of, out of place or, you know, just coming out of her face, as she would say. I would just respect her and sternly say, no, mom, that's wrong. 
I would not disrespect for her. And, 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 and my father, I never disrespected the man, ever. Even though, you know, probably could have used a little. No. <laughs> but no, I just didn't. I just knew that no matter what, I'm going to try to find a way to get out of the situation or diffuse the situation. Sometimes you have to exit. You have to take a time out and exit the building. You know, Jessica has left the building, whatever it is. But that's a good way for you to honor and respect even if they're toxic. Because there is a promise that it will be well with you and you can live long on the earth. I want things to be well with me and I want to live long on the earth. So I will honor and respect my mom and, and well, dad's in heaven. Um, you know, because the Lord told me to do it too. I'm obeying him. But I know it can't, it, sometimes it's not easy. But just try to find a way, even if it means you have to walk away or not answer them. You know, whatever it is, just try to ask Jesus to help you navigate through the situations and to react in a way that would make him proud of you. You know? So there's that. So that was good. I don't know. Okay, so now... Now this, 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 it says fathers, but we're gonna, it's really to parents. So Colossians 3.21 in the New Living Translation says fathers, but the word fathers really is actually aimed at parents. So it's saying parents, because it could be a father or a mother. Do not aggravate your children. See, so right back at you. If you're toxic, stop it. Do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. And you know what? God don't like that. God don't like ugly. Colossians 3.21 in the New King James Version says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Well, what does it mean to provoke? Okay. It means to irritate or discourage children by harsh yelling, nagging, or deriding their efforts. Deriding, what does that mean? Laughing at with contempt, mocking, ridiculing. <clears throat> your child is trying to do something and you're mocking them, you're ridiculing them, you're laughing at them with contempt, that's abuse. Okay, don't irritate them, don't harshly yell at them. You know what, what happens when you constantly yelling at the top of your lungs at kids? They become immune to it. They don't hear you anymore. You speak with that soft, you know, excuse me, what are you doing? And then they're like, ah. <clears throat> Harsh yelling, nagging, or deriding their efforts. And that's important because sometimes children are trying to, imp they're trying to like do things because they want that approval from mommy or daddy. And then if they do something and they want you to be proud of them because they love you, and then you laugh at them with contempt, mock or ridicule their efforts, that's, kind of disgusting, or even ignore their efforts. <clears throat> I've heard of that kind of thing too. Such provocations, do you know what a provocation is? A provocation is when anything that excites anger, the cause that causes resentment, the act of exciting anger. So act, um, the act of exciting anger in a person that causes resentment wounds their spirits, and then makes them become timid where they are discouraged. And we want to raise up our kids to be strong, you know, mentally and in their hearts. So be healthy and do it God's way. And you know what God's way is? Spare the rod, spoil the child. I know it's not uh, politically correct in today's day, but you don't do it angry. I used to have a spoon in every room of the house. I did. I had a wooden spoon in every room of the house. I had a wooden spoon that was tiny, like, you know, in my purse. And I would just say, if you do this, I have to give you the spoon. So don't do this, okay? They do it. All right, now i got to keep my promise. I told you if you did it, you were going to get the spoon, so now I have to give you the spoon. So I don't do it in anger. I give them the spoon. And then they realize, because kids are gamblers. I don't know if you knew this, but kids gamble. 
when they see that you falter back and forth and you say that you're going to do something, you don't do it, then they start gambling. <laughs> yeah. Mom said that last time and she didn't do nothing. So I'm going to go for it and take my chances and see how far I can get. And if mom's going to really keep her word. And they, they, they know. They just, so they, so I used to just say, okay, I have to keep my promise. Come here and get the spoon. And one day, Victoria was really funny. <clears throat> One day I gave her the spoon. I would try it on myself. You know, I would like, you know, I have to get the right wrist action. Okay. And uh, I had to know what the sting felt like. So uh, one day I was giving the spoon to Victoria. And she was like, that didn't even hurt. I'm like, man, you should have been smarter than that. Okay, at least Amanda would play it off if it didn't hurt. <laughs> no, so I was like, oh, okay, I'll make it harder. <laughs> Because sin is supposed to sting, <laughs> but you don't do it in anger. You know, the butt cheeks were made for that. That's extra cushion, and, you can take, and it could take a nice little sting, you know, a little flick of the wrist, you know, and it's good. And then when they see that you're not lying and that you keep your word, they don't mess with you. My girls were amazing when they were little. Now? No. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Okay, so moving right along. I, this is good. I like this. I love the word of God. Colossians 3, 20 through to 25. Okay, servants, or parentheses, employees. Obey in everything within reason. Those who are your earthly masters, not only when their eyes are on you as pleasers of men, but in simplicity of purpose with all of your heart because of your reverence for the Lord, not because of them, because of your reverence for the Lord, and as a sincere expression of your devotion to him. Whatever may be your task, work at it heartily from the soul as something done for the Lord and not for men, knowing with all certainty that it is from the Lord and not from men that you will receive the inheritance which is your real reward. The one whom you are actually serving is the Lord Christ, the Messiah. For he who deals wrongfully, we're going to go through all of this, will reap the fruit of his folly and be punished for his wrongdoing. And with God, there is no partiality, no matter what a person's position may be, whether he is the slave or the master. And I will read now Colossians 4.1 in the Amplified first. Masters, on your part, deal with your slaves, and we're going to co cover slavery, okay? Justly and fairly, or you could say employers, on your part, deal with your employees justly and fairly, knowing that also you have a master in heaven. In Colossians 4.1 in the Passion Translation, employers, Treat your workers with equality and justice as you know that you also have a Lord and Master in heaven who is watching you. So, I'll, I'll, I'll cover slavery. Why did the church of that day openly oppose slavery and seek to destroy it? I'm glad you asked. For one thing, the church was the minority. And it had no political power at that time to change any institution that was built into the social order. So here, Paul is not approving. He does not approve of slavery, nor the, does he authorize revolts against the masters. He simply is instructing servants and masters how to conduct themselves in a Christ-honoring way. Kind of like when we deal with toxic people, how to conduct ourselves in a Christ-honoring way. By doing so, he attempts to change this undesirable situation from within, from within the relationship. Paul aims to regulate it to the benefit of all that are involved. So, wanted to cover that. It's just a fact, you know, the slavery today. It's, it's awful. <clears throat> um, but I'm not going to get into all that right now. So, okay. Verse 20 through 23, with all your heart. So you are to do everything that those uh, earthly mas masters ask to you to do, not, w not just because they're watching you, but with all of your heart because of your reverence for the Lord, right? 
And I always say within reason, because you could be working for a tool, okay, who's asking you to do illegal things. So obviously you're not going to do that. That's why I always say within reason, you do your duties. Um, and just don't work for a drug dealer, okay? <laughs> Simple as that, okay? All righty, then. Okay, so, um, so with all your heart is in honest dedication. <clears throat> we owe fiduciary duties to our employers as to the Lord himself. Who is your real, who is your real supervisor? The Lord Jesus. So Paul encourages Christians to consider all of their efforts and labors as a service directly to the Lord. Now, fiduciary, what a word, right? Okay. When I see that word, I think of taking ownership. If you're working for a company or small business, you're taking ownership of that alongside with your owner, uh, with the, uh, the employer, okay? You're putting your heart and your soul into it. You're like a trustee. So you're taking ownership and you're doing the best that you can do with excellence, but you're not even doing it unto your employer. You're doing it unto the Lord because his eyes are ever on you. So like even with the church, for instance, <clears throat> you could tell who takes ownership and who doesn't. You could tell when people are throwing things around and abusing the place and when people actually care and they pick up the piece of garbage. And that's being fiduciary. You're doing it. You're taking ownership in your heart. And you're doing it unto the Lord with excellence. <clears throat> and it says here that knowing with all certainty that it is from the Lord and not from men that you will receive an inheritance, which is your real re reward. The one whom you are actually serving is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So <clears throat> you are co-heirs co with Christ. You are, you are, and I, I say that, you know, as a matter of fact, you are a, son, a faithful son or daughter of the king, and what an in incredible inheritance that will be. So those are so the people who are doing the right thing as Christians. But now, that other one says, for he who deals wrongfully will reap the fruit of his folly and be punished for his wrongdoing. And with God, there is no partiality. No matter what a person's position may be, whether he is the slave or the master, and then it's like a warning. And maybe, you know, because the master's had an issue. <sighs> Masters, on your part, deal with your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that also you have a master in heaven. Or I like the passion better. <clears throat> Colossians 4.1. Employers, treat your workers with equality and justice, as you know that you also have a Lord and master in heaven who is watching you. So mistreatment of others by Christians is a serious matter. It's a serious matter in God's eyes, affecting our future in heaven. You may go to heaven, but it's affecting your rewards. Those who treat others in love and goodness will receive a reward from the Lord. It'll be tried by fire and it'll come out gold. Anyone who mistreats and does wrong to another, especially a believer, will be paid back for the wrong he has done. Those who are guilty of such behavior will be judged and will bear the consequences without bias or partiality. See, you know, because it's, it's not socialism in heaven, you know. How we walk before the Lord in obedience and the responsibilities he gives us. And he says, you know, you were faithful with a little, you know, good and faithful, uh, good and faithful servant, you know, Here's your reward. I'm going to make you in charge of this, this, and that in heaven. So you can get in by the skin of your teeth, and then you're kind of like at the bottom. But everybody's happy in heaven, so don't, you know, that doesn't matter. Because, you know, um, I think Kevin said I said he saw some guy who, like, died in an in in unfortunate circumstance where he didn't really do anything to get rewards in heaven. But he was skipping like a, ki like a girl, he said. <laughs> So happy to be in heaven. So, you know, everybody's happy in heaven. But, you know, I want some responsibilities. I want the Lord to say, okay, good and thou faithful servant. You were faithful at this. Come on. This is what you're in charge of. So, yes, you know. So, that's that. All right, so moving on to another subject. So, we covered husbands and wives, children. We covered working. And actually, in everything you do. In everything you do, do it unto the Lord. 
then everything will be excellent. And, and I'm a work in progress. See? I don't know why Pastor Rob used to do that. He says, as I'm pointing at you, my thumb is pointing right back at me. Because <laughs> I don't point that way. <laughs> okay. Colossians 4, 2 and 4 through 4, the Amplified. We're talking about prayer now. Be persistent and devoted to prayer. Be alert and focused in your prayer life with an attitude of thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us too that God will open a door of opportunity for us for the word to proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I have been imprisoned, that I may make it clear and speak boldly and unfold the mystery in a way I should. So in the Greek to be persistent or steadfast. It means to continue, continue steadily, to just be in a forward-moving motion, steadily, you know? You don't have to go fast, just but you're moving steadily forward and you're continuing, in perpetual motion. Continue stead steadily and pers or persevere, implying a strong determination and passion for prayer. We should have a passion for prayer. It's not a drudgery. It's actually c talking to the creator of everything, your dad, you know, and le listening, learning to listen, which is something I want to talk about. Um, when I went to the Women's <coughs> Fellowship at Abundant Life last week, <coughs> Pastor Ron, who is the main speaker, that man was basically cracking the whip and hitting us between the eyes with the fact that we talk too much in prayer and that we should start learning to listen. So I, I, I know I talk too much in prayer. So I have to learn to listen, you know. So, <clears throat> you know, lay your request before the Lord. Tell him you love him. Give him thanks. Then get your little notebook out and be quiet and see what thought impressions come. I've had a couple of love letters written to me by the Lord. When I was done and I read it through, I was like, wow. Whew, that was good. He really loves me. He really loves me. So, <clears throat> so be alert and focused. In another translation, it says watchful. And that's to be spiritually awake and watchful. In order to devote ourselves to serious prayer, we must be alert to the many things that would distract us as we attempt to pray. Oh my gosh, that phone. Anything, right? So you just have to be alert to the many things that will try to, because the devil does not want you praying. He knows his power in prayer. He knows who you're talking to. He don't want it. He doesn't even, he especially doesn't want you to listen. <clears throat> we must discipline ourselves to develop the kind of prayer life necessary for spiritual maturity and consistent victory. The passion, passionate devotion to prayer must be based on love. Absolutely. And gratitude to Jesus for what he has done for us. Because we love him. We want to talk to him. You know, how would you feel if you were married and your marriage partner didn't want to talk to you? They ignored you all the time. It's sad. <clears throat> you know, you want to share your day and, you know, what you got in the word. You want to share. So if they ignore you and they don't talk to you, it's very sad. It makes you sad. So... Same way with Jesus. I mean, the Holy Spirit, you think he doesn't get kind of grieved if we ignore him? So, <clears throat> okay. So verse 3, like Paul, we should also be praying that God would open doors of opportunity for us. Because I really like that. Pray for us that the Lord would open doors of opportunity. <clears throat> we need those doors. So we should pray for each other that the Lord would open doors of opportunity for each of us and help us to recognize those opportunities. And then we should pray for the boldness to step through those open doors. Because it's scary out there. But we, we can trust him to help us make the most of every opportunity and accomplish all that he desires of us. Redeeming the time. And then he prayed, um, he asked them to pray. Just as Paul desired, we should pray that the Lord speak through us in the only way that he can, so that it is clearly understood and received 
by the hearers as we speak with the boldness that he gives us. That's very important. Because sometimes, all right, and, and you know how like, like when Jesus went to his hometown and he couldn't do many miracles there? Because familiarity too, you know? And um, <clears throat> that's what it is. Like, who are you? you? You were Joseph's son. You're just a carpenter. Like, what? I don't think so. And that's the same thing with the families. You know, sometimes the closest you are to people, the less they're going to hear you. So what you do is you pray, Lord God, please send them people into their lives, laborers, people that can become their friends, or just anybody that they meet to come into their lives to bring them the word in a way that they can understand it and receive it and receive Jesus to go deeper, get out of the nominal Christian lifestyle and be more dedicated to the Lord. You know, like, because... Sometimes, and, and I think we've all experienced that, where you tell somebody something and then all of a sudden somebody else tells them the same thing and all of a sudden they listen. And I even had that with Pastor Rob, okay? Be like, you know, honey, and he'd be like, okay. And he didn't do it. And then all of a sudden, you know, hon. I was like, really? Okay. <laughs> but that's just the guy, because you know what? In our human nature, we just take each other for granted. So that's something we have to try not to because life is really, really short. <clears throat> And tomorrow's not promised. <clears throat> so, review. <laughs> Submit to one another in love. Be under one's mission and have each other's back in marriage and in the body of Christ. Children, obey your parents. Honor and respect them so that it may go well with you and you live a long life. Parents, don't provoke, aggravate, or discourage your children by harsh yelling, mocking, or ridiculing their efforts, exciting them to anger that wounds their spirits. In other words, be healthy, not toxic. As an employee, do everything unto the Lord with excellence and ownership, also in everything you do in life. As employers, treat your employees with equality and justice, remembering that the Lord God is your master and you answer to him. Number six, continue steadfast in prayer, being watchful with thanksgiving, praying also for doors of opportunity and sharing the good news of Jesus, depending on him for the words and the boldness. Got some good meat today? Okay. Hallelujah. I love you guys. Father God, in the name of Jesus, <clears throat> I thank you for your word. We need it. We need to read it every day for the rest of our lives on this earth. We need to continue to receive revelation. So we ask that as we read your word, that you give us revelation each and every time, new and unfolding, like the peeling open of a stinky onion, but it's not stinky. We need you, Father. We need your word. Please give us a, a hunger and a thirst and an unquenchable desire for you and your word to love you, to honor you with our lives, <clears throat> to surrender our lives to you, to repent when we need to repent, to allow you to sanctify us and set us apart for your use. We give you our lives, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.